Just a, a little bit of a segue from the, uh, the, the, the last uh, presentation. We actually have our own light-based sculptures at NASA. This is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is just for us. This is behind the security gates. This is actually not a public piece. And this actually shows you when we are in real time uploading or downloading data from one of our hundreds of satellites out around the Earth or out in deep space. And that's the artist there, Dan Goods. He, he's actually called our visual strategist at NASA because trying to keep somebody on the payroll as artist with government funding is difficult. And, um, but you know, I, it, to me this is really wonderful because it, it keeps us, I mean, here, here comes, we're beaming up to Voyager now. So um, this actually responds to the real signals. This is not just an installation that randomly picks times. It responds to when we really are uploading commands or downloading data from our spacecraft. So that's, that's it's something I love to watch whenever I'm at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here comes the new stuff from Voyager coming back there. So there we go. At any rate, astronomers have an expression called first light. And, and first light literally means the first time you ever look through a new telescope. Telescopes, satellites, they all have their moment of first light. You often see uh, a scientist cheering, you know, first light from Curiosity rover and all of that. It, it's sort of amazing to me that the, the first light, the first first light was only about 400 years ago. Uh, before then, every observation of the universe ever made took place through the human eye. And that only changed when we made these, these artificial instruments. Now, now Galileo, of course, is, is sort of known by everybody as being the first person to use a telescope. It's actually not true. He wasn't the first. He didn't have the best telescope at the time, probably not even the best one in Florence. Um, his telescope only magnified by a factor of three to begin with. So a good pair of binoculars completely blows away anything Galileo could have done. Uh, pretty soon after that, he had one that magnified by about a power of 12. But these, these little paper tubes were used by the Dutch to basically look at you know, ships coming into the harbor. And uh, Galileo turned one up at the sky. And because he was a very popular member of the Medici court and was very much in the public eye, he sort of gets the credit of being the first person to use a telescope. But whether or not he was, he's a brilliant man. And you know, I think it's amazing that it's only been 400 years that we've had this artificial way of experiencing life. And what he saw revolutionized everything. This is a, a, a little bit of an excerpt from one of his books called Sidereus Nuncius, or The Starry Messenger. And he saw these little tiny lights that were whizzing around the planet Jupiter. And we'd never seen anything orbiting something other than the Earth before this time. All of a sudden, he saw these little stars. And of course, after his patrons, the Medicis, he called them the Medician stars. And uh, they were whizzing around, changing their position. And eventually, he worked out they were actually orbiting around Jupiter. Now, um, the Greeks knew that the sun was in the center of the solar system, actually. This was sort of lost knowledge. It wasn't that Galileo discovered that the Earth was not the center of the solar system. But this was some proof that basically people could just not deny anymore. And it changed the way we looked at reality itself. No longer was the Earth in the center. There are two different ways that we make these new eyes. Uh, to some extent, we can actually be here on Earth and make beautiful telescopes that look out into space. They open up their eye for the first time, and each telescope sees the universe in a completely unique, different way that it's never been seen. Or we can send our eyes somewhere else. You know, we, we actually put them on a satellite, we, we put them billions of miles away in some cases, and then we open an eye to something that's never been seen. And in the case of these satellites, both things happened. Uh, these are the Galilean, the Medicean stars, the Galilean satellites, we call them now, uh, seen when we actually put space probes out there to look at them. Uh, some of these are from the Voyager spacecraft, some of these are Galileo pictures. But these are the four largest moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has over 60 moons, but these four are so big that Galileo could see them even with a factor of 10 magnifying. And uh, some of them are incredibly significant bodies. The, uh, the third one in the middle is, is Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. Ganymede is very nearly the size of the planet Mars. It's bigger than the planet Mercury. So th these are, are, are wonderfully significant bodies in and of themselves. The, uh, the nearest one, Io, the yellow one, um, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And at any given moment, like right now, there, there are two to 300 volcanoes going off on, on Io. So these were not boring, dead little worlds, but, but significant places that we'd never seen until we actually sent an eye out there to see them. Europa, the next one, uh, has more liquid water on it than the entire planet Earth. It's underneath a beautiful shell of ice. Uh, the ice cracks and shifts. And in some cases, water vapor is released from the cracks. This is a particularly exciting place because we've just been given permission by the U.S. Congress to mount a probe to go out there and see what's under the ice of Europa. You'll notice the, uh, the cracks are darker colored, and that's due to salt and organic molecules leaching up from the water underneath. So very exciting world that we're just getting ready to send a new eye to right now. 
Ganymede, by the way, I mentioned how much liquid water had. Uh, um, so Europa itself has more liquid water than the Earth. Ganymede has a, approaching three to four times the amount of liquid water as the Earth. And uh, Ganymede's surface is kind of cratered, it's older looking, it's actually kind of a dirty, icy surface. But underneath that, we've detected the presence of oceans that are 60 miles deep. And uh, these are saltwater oceans, they conduct electricity. We find them by looking at the way the northern and southern lights play across the surface of Ganymede. And we can actually detect the water underneath using that. So amazingly significant places we never knew were, we, that were there until we sent an eye out. Now, um, another thing that Galileo saw that really kind of blew the lid off our, our sense of reality was when he looked at, at regions of the sky, including the Orion constellation, he saw stars there that were invisible to the naked eye. Basically, they were so far away and so faint that you couldn't see them without a telescope. When you turn a telescope up at the sky, you could see stars that were too faint for the naked eye to see. And Galileo had to ask the question, why would God have made stars that you can't see unless you invented technology? <laughs> and it, it actually led to some pretty brilliant letters. If you haven't read the letter from Galileo to the Archduchess Christina, who was his patron, who was worried about whether this work would eventually disprove God. It's a brilliant juxtaposition of science and reason and, and, and religion and how they don't need to be enemies. I really recommend you read that letter. But, but still, what, what is out there that we can't see at all? that we have no inkling of unless we actually build one of these new artificial eyes. And one of the things I think about most are the galaxies. Now, 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 galaxies are families of stars. A spiral galaxy like this one is actually about, about a half a trillion stars, 500 billion stars. And um, they all rotate around a common center. We actually live in one very much like this called the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's hard to explain how big these things are. I, I use a term called light years. I think most of you know what that is. It's the distance that light travels in one year. Um, in miles, it's about six trillion miles. The, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. And we actually came in today to hear about light traveling and how fast it travels, those, those Coke bottles and everything. So uh, traveling at light speed, it would take you about 100,000 years to get across one of these galaxies. And um, the only way I can really explain how, how big that is, is, is when you think about the sun, the, the sun is a huge thing. You could fit a million Earths inside the sun. But if the sun were on the scale of the grain, a grain of sand, so if you could fit a million Earths inside a grain of sand, so just that that's how big the sun is, how big would a galaxy be? In the case of a galaxy like this, it would be larger than the continental United States, larger from the distance from New York to Los Angeles. That's just one galaxy. Now, how many galaxies are there out there? Well, this is something we needed artificial eyes to find out. And we did something rather controversial. A couple years ago, I guess approaching 10 years ago now, we actually stared at an empty part of the sky, somewhere where we could not see anything. It was entirely dark. And believe me, there are plenty of astronomers that didn't want us to spend precious Hubble Space Telescope time staring at an empty part of the sky. We stared at it for a month, continuously. And this is what we found. Okay, this is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, every single little blotch you see there is a galaxy. Not, not a star, but a collection of, of half a trillion stars. There are, are something on the order of 3,000 identifiable galaxies in this picture. An area where we had thought was entirely dark and empty. And I'm going to go back to the grain of sand. So we talked about you know, the sun being the size of a grain of sand. How much of this night sky is this? How much are you looking at? If you take a grain of sand and you hold it at arm's length, that's about the amount of sky that this represents, with 1 60 billionth of the sky. A little bit of a, a close up there. You can start to believe that some of those are, are actually galaxies and not just little blobs. We are seeing out to a distance in this image of approximately 12 billion light years away. And light takes that long to get to you from that distance. It took 12 billion years to get to you. So we are seeing images, light coming from well before the Earth and the Sun ever formed. Now, as powerful as you think the Hubble Space Telescope may be, there are times you really just need to go there. And here's a picture of Pluto, the best way that Hubble could see it. So this was the best picture of Pluto we had as of like a few months ago. And it's not even really an image, it's a map. Uh, the, 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 uh, this is just pixels mapped onto a sphere. We could see that some areas were bright and some were dark. And that, of course, is what we got just a couple months ago when we finally sent New Horizons out to look at this planet we'd never seen before. So nearly three billion miles away, we have Pluto there. It's a land of, of glaciers and ice. I can talk a lot more about the features if you want to ask me later. Um, that, that wonderful heart 
shape that you see there is actually a giant glacier of nitrogen ice. And the nitrogen ice is, is actually kind of swirling and coming up around mountains. These mountains are made of pure water ice. They're very jagged. At temperature is only about 40 degrees above absolute zero. Water is as hard as granite. So you get mountains made of granite. And these mountains are about as high as the Appalachians. So you're looking at beautiful glaciers moving around some mountains here. This is really a picture of us flying over Pluto, right? That's, that's not an artist's conception. This is really what's out there that we never saw until we sent that eye out there. So I want to end a little bit on, on some of the other ways that our eyes are somewhat limited. Um, this is a famous picture from Hubble. It was taken 10 years ago, 1995, called the Pillars of Creation. And uh, th these are, are giant clouds of dust and gas that are forming young stars inside them. They are hundreds of billions of miles across. And you see, this is what they looked like in 1995 when we had the best camera you could make 20 years ago. This is what they looked like two years ago when we actually put a new camera on the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that the colors are a little different, the framing is a little different. It's more sensitive, it's more clear. Every telescope shows you a universe you've never seen before. Both of these are true. Both of these are real light, real photons that we counted and measured, but they look different. Now, here's the same cloud in a different camera on Hubble, which sees in invisible light, infrared light. And we, we heard a little about that today. This is heat light. You, you actually experience it as, as heat. All of those stars that you see in that frame were, were there the whole time. I mean, if I sort of do a comparison, there, there's visible light, the type of, eye, type of light your eye sees, and here's uh, infrared. It turns out that there was so much dust in that cloud that the dust was absorbing visible light and blocking the thousands of stars that existed that we couldn't see unless we looked in the invisible sort of light. Invisible light can show us totally unseen worlds. This is a, a view from the Chandra X-ray telescope. X-rays are only produced when gas is millions of degrees hot. And so this is something you can't see at all unless your eye is sensitive only to things that are a million degrees or hotter. This is a dead star. It's called a neutron star. It's whipping up hot gas around it that is impacting a dust cloud and creating these streamers, which look a lot like a hand, actually. It's very dramatic. But uh, imagine being blind to anything except million degrees or hotter material. So ending on that, you know, light challenges us in so many ways. Not only did Galileo have to re-evaluate reality, you know, Earth is not the center, our human senses are not the center, there are stars out there we can't see. To answer uh, this, this, this scientist artist question, what do you see when you're riding on a photon? At light speed, light has actually asked us to re-evaluate the definition of reality. At light speed, time stops and all points in space converge into one. The light arriving at me from that spotlight does not experience space, time, or causality the way that we do. And it is making scientists think that maybe we don't have the faintest idea yet what the definition of reality really is. <laughs> That's light. Thank you. <laughs>